<laughs> so we're, we're, we're delighted about Belinda coming here. I'm, I'm sure you all know Belinda, but Belinda is a native daughter of New Harbor, born and raised here, went to Bristol schools, Lincoln Academy, then on to Bates College. After her bait, she goes on to the University of North Carolina for her master's degree in Boston Black College first. <laughs> for Boston College after Bates. Oh, sorry. Well, in any she's a very well educated person, studying also a PhD. Yeah. So, in any event, and then teaches classics, of course, at the University of Southern Maine until. University of Southern Maine has the ridiculous notion that they're going to cancel the classics okay. department. Okay. <laughs> but in any event, Belinda also runs Harborside Cabin and lives now in Cumberland and in New Harbor. Belinda, <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, Let's give a thank you, thank you, Bobby. <laughs> Well, I, I too want to thank you for coming out this evening. I know it's a holiday weekend, people have guests, and there's a lot to do this weekend, so I really appreciate you um, coming out. Um, a couple of years ago, um, we gave the first Down Memory Lane talk, and since then it's become something of a tradition and an opportunity to showcase items uh, from the OBHS collections. Uh, either items that have been donated to us or items that have been loaned to us and scanned so that we can include them in our digital images archive. This evening I'm going to be talking about a very special uh, time period, a very special group of postcards that are produced between 1901 and 1915. And I'm going to get right into it because uh, I've got a lot of them. If you've been to one of my shows before, you, you know. <laughs> Oops. What's happening? <laughs> okay. Let me just end and go back in and see if that helps. There we go. Um, I think... Often, I'm starting with a black and white postcard. <laughs> if you go to the uh, Bristol History Center, we actually have a, a, an exhibit this summer, it will be there all summer, which shows the black and white uh, postcards that were produced, most of them by the Eastern Illustrating Company. That company started in 1909 and went to 1947. And I think people sometimes gravitate towards the old black and whites, and there's a reason why they do that, and that's because these old black and whites are real photo cards. That is, uh, the glass plate negatives uh, are placed directly on photographic paper, and that's why there is such detail in, these, in the old postcards that are black and white. It's also why they fade and why they yellow, because they are real photographs. But um, when Eastern Illustrating did it, they, this whole series of black and white cards is a wonderful historical resource for us, which preserves the way Bristol looked during the teens and the 20s. A lot of them seem to have been shot in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. Um, I'm also starting with another, another photograph here in black and white. This is a photograph that came to us from the Booth Bay Historical Association, and it's a real photograph of the dedication of Fort William Henry in 1909. And you can see there's some speaker, well, actually the speaker's platform's out. But this was the dedication uh, when the fort was built. But here's the magic. So, Keep your eye on the picture. Can I mention that I think Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was one of the speakers? Yes, he was, as well as the governor, and um, it, was, it was quite a big event. But keep your eye on the photo. Oh. <laughs> so as you can see, this is the exact same photo, which has now been colorized. And uh, we, I'm actually going to show this photo again later on. So um, I always try to get a little history in here, too. 
Delteology, I learned a new word while researching this. Delteology is the hobby of collecting postcards. Uh, Delteon was the Greek word, classicist here, the Greek word for little tablet. And so a postcard, they named it Delteology. The heyday of collecting postcards, or the craze, the postcard craze, began around 1901. And it actually has a lot to do with these colorized postcards that we're going to see today. Um, so around, uh, around 1901, um, these artistic colorized postcards began to be uh, shot by photographers here, but they were all sent to Europe to be printed and colorized. And that is because Europe had a very long tradition of art. <laughs> if you've ever been to Europe, you see art everywhere. So they had a very long tradition of art. They had a very long tradition of printing as well. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and so the most artistic cards came from Europe or were printed in Europe. By 1907, 75% of all the postcards sold in the United States were printed in Europe. Um, in 1908, it was reported that Hugh C. Layton Company, and you're going to see lots of postcards by Hugh C. Layton. This was a company that was in, uh, located in Portland, Maine, and it was one of the biggest printers of postcards in the United States. Um, they had a weekly production rate of one million cards, one to one and a half million postcards. And they were of the colorized variety that you're going to see tonight. In 1908, the US Postal Service reported that almost 700 million postcards had been mailed that year. This is, a, this is a reflection of this collecting phase. People were, were mailing postcards to their friends to collect. Um, and by 1913, that number was over 900 million postcards mailed. Um, the date 1901, I forgot to mention that in the very beginning. In the year, well, in 1898, the Postal Service allowed privately printed cards to be mailed at the same rate as government issued postcards. And that rate was one cent. Before 1898, you could mail a privately printed greeting card. There were greeting cards and, um, that were mailed. But they had to be mailed at the letter rate. And they, it just didn't become a big craze of collecting. But in 19, uh, 1898, one cent to mail a, a private colorized postcard. And in 1901, the reason why that date is significant is because the Postal Service in that year allowed privately printed cards to be called postcards. Before that year, there was no such thing as a, a privately printed postcard. So um, tonight's show is going to feature uh, two different periods. Uh, the, the years from 1901 to 1915 are kind of broken up into two segments, 1901 to 1906 and 1906 to 1915. Uh, there is what I mentioned before, the term postcard uh, couldn't be used before 1901. In 1901, uh, a postcard would look like this. On, they call them the undivided backs. So the back of the postcard could only hold the address. You could not write a note on the back. The front of the cards left a little area where you could write a small, a small note. So it's very, it's very easy to recognize 1901 to 1906. And we'll see some during our presentation today. <clears throat> some call 1907 to 1915 the golden age of postcards. Sometimes that date is earlier. But here in 1907, 
it became legal to print a postcard with a divided back. So you would have the address on one side and message may be written on this side. <laughs> you had to tell people that they could write a message there. As you can see, one cent. It only cost one cent uh, to, to mail it. This was also important for the front side, too, because now the photo could be extended to the very edge of the card. And so the images actually became a little larger. I do want to note one thing. Uh, you probably recognize this. This is Damascata. It's the steamer landing uh, where schooner landing is now. Um, the, okay, let's get official here. Um, postcard, the, the color of the postcard goes to the very edge of the card, and this little white border is nothing. Um, and I mentioned this, uh, that's, the postcard is the colorized part. It did not have a white border around it. And I mentioned that because that is another phase of postcards later on. Um, in, the, in the 40s, um, they started reducing the amount of ink to be used for postcards, so they began to leave an unprinted area around the card. But this is, this is deceptive right there. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, he's the scanner. <laughs> so before we look at these cards, I wanted to try to... Um, say a little bit about how they were printed. I may have bitten off more than I could chew here because it got very complex. <laughs> Certain um, discussions were so simple they left me with too many questions and, and some technical writings were so complex I couldn't understand them. So <laughs> I'm gonna share what I did understand and if you're interested I'll leave it to you to figure out all the details. But I did find this quite interesting. There were three processes of the postcards that we're gonna be seeing tonight and this is the method of printing. One are half tones. Um, and if there's any artists here, you'll probably know more about this than I will. But um, half toning is, is the practice of dividing a picture into dots. And those dots could be different colors. And depending on how dense the dots were or how big the dots were, it would provide a colored surface. Um, so to produce multiple colors, well, the dots, um, Okay, so the very first thing I had read said that when they invented this process, the first thing they did was pass the image through gauze, a piece of gauze. And you pass the light through, and then there's just all these little dots. Um, later on, they developed screens, so like wire screens to pass the image through. And they would use multiple screens um, to produce a different color. And the half tones generally use very few um, colors of ink. There's like three colors of ink that could be layered together to create other colors, if you know about mixing colors. Um, so red and yellow would make a pink, or, or, red, or red and white would make a pink. You'd start with a layer of do uh, black dots and then layer it on. So, to actually print it, it has to go through the print, at printing press, at least four times. So you print the one layer, then you print the next one, then you print the next one, and you print the next one. This is a, um, and you will see cards, you'll recognize them, you'll look at them, and you'll think, ah, oh, those are dots. <laughs> this is an enlargement, but I wanted to kind of show you, if you zoomed out, you would have the optical illusion of a pink sky, but if you zoom way in, you'll see the yellow and the red. Uh, the, other, the other type of printing were collotypes and lithographs. And, um, and I have actually seen these terms used interchangeably. Uh, technically, they are used different materials. So a collotype, the negative, uh, well, it would start with a metal plate. It would have a light sensitive material, a gelatin, put on the plate, and then the, um, 
you would need to use different plates for the different colors. And in this process, unlike the half toning that would use only a few colors, this would use maybe up to eight different plates, nine, 10, 12. You could create multiple plates with multiple colors and create what we're gonna see, the beautiful colored postcards. The lithograph, technically a lithograph is very much the same, except instead of a metal plate with gelatin on it, it's technically a, a slab of limestone. And again, there would be, um, you would put the ink on one and it would be the red plate, the red stone, and then the blue stone, and then the yellow stone. And again, it would have to, each large, piece of paper that would print multiple postcards would go through the press multiple times. You'd have to pass it through 10 times and just layer, layer, layer on the colors. Also off, offset lithography uh, with proper name for because it uh, went from whatever Oh yes. Was on to a uh, to pad or whatever, which is actually uh, yes. Th thank you. Um, that's the part I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> How you get from the stone tablet to a rubber cylinder, which would copy it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the lithographs, when you know Curry and I said, when did they start doing lithographs? That was early nineteen hundred. Yes. Yes. And they did artistic lith lithographs very early on um, as art prints. I mean, uh, uh, but they only started doing them with photographs, obviously, once photography uh, started being used. But um, I know artists do lithographs all the time, the press, press. It. And again, European artists, you know, they have this long tradition of producing these artworks. So, that's about as technical as I can get, but I did, but I did want, I did find this interesting series of postcards, and if you can just bear with me for a moment, I will explain what they are. They have nothing to do with Bristol at all. So there's a company in London that produces uh, beef extract, I guess beef stock or beef extract. It's called the Liebig, uh, Liebig Beef Extract Company. <laughs> so uh, they sold their product all over Europe and one of the things they did was produce advertising cards. This is an advertising card for beef extract. Now I said it was the company was based in London but the writing here is Italian because this set of cards was meant to advertise their product in Italy. Okay, you, you with me so far? <laughs> So the reason why I'm showing them to you is because it's a series of six cards that wants to show you the phases of making a chromo, a, a chromograph, uh, like a lithograph. Actually, they are lithographs because they use stone. This is an artist making his art print into a litho lithograph. But the reason I want to show it to you is because I want you to focus on the portrait here. Because as we go, so here's the portrait in two colors plus yellow. And as this series progresses, we're going to layer on more colors as it goes through the printing press multiple times. Now it's in four colors. So four different plates have been used. That, by the way, is the chemist who developed the method to extract the beef extract. <laughs> Liebig. Now we have six colors, six times through the press. Now we have eight colors. It's the exact same portrait, just with layers and layers added to it. Now it's in 10 colors. And there you can see the offset, like you were saying, Dan. Um, here's a stone. I don't know how it gets onto whatever 
rubber cylinders there are, but it does, and then it goes through. And you can see the large piece of paper with the multiple cards being printed. And then we finally have the final one, the richest one, but you can see how rich the color is with 12 uh, different colors layered on. And uh, in, the last in the last one, they're cutting those large sheets into the individual cards. I thought that was a pretty neat, uh, <laughs> pretty neat thing. Okay, so now the rest of the show is just a show of all these pretty postcards. <laughs> Um, there are different printers. Uh, the ones, by the end of this show, you'll be able to pick out a Hugh C. Layton postcard because they are by far the prettiest. Um, this is, this is um, not one of his cards, but um, as you know, this is the Walpole Church, meeting, the Walpole Meeting House, and they, there's two postcards here of the Walpole Meeting House. They put the wrong date on it. Yeah. It was uh, erected in 1772, not 1776. Uh, but uh, early 1900s, people are beginning to be interested in history. And so they have a postcard of a very old building that they uh, are interested in seeing. This is a Hugh C. Layton postcard, and you can see how, richer, how much richer the colors are. That has the same date. Yeah, they still have the wrong date. <laughs> they just couldn't get that one right. And then here's a postcard of the interior of the church. Again, I think for people that were interested in history, and at least it says erected 1772, repaired. Um, the reason this isn't a particularly pretty postcard, but I put it up there because I was interested in the stovepipe. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize that there must have been two stoves there, one on each side uh, with the smoke going up. So there was a little bit of heat in those old churches. Right. Most of the heat came from his troubled pipes. Right. <laughs> okay, I've got another, another uh, magic moment to show you. Uh, here's Bristol Mills going down. Town. Here's the town hall. And it doesn't look like it looks today because the town hall was added onto in 1912. Um, and so this, we know the photo was taken before 1912. But keep your eye on the photo. And there we, there we go. <laughs> Much prettier. <laughs> Okay, so um, I've tried to, to pick out postcards from different villages around town, so we can take a little look through. You know, every, anybody know where this is? No? Pemaquid Falls. Falls. Falls, yeah. Oh, it says up there, huh? <laughs> it's a test. <laughs> We are standing basically in front of the mill, looking towards Damrascata. Oh, okay. And today, the road goes straight through that house, and you would turn here onto Harrington Road. Oh, okay. But the road was built right through that house. That house, by the way, was moved. Bobby likes to talk about buildings that are moved from one place to another around Bristol. It was moved to Pemaquid Harbor. Um, this house? That, that was the parsonage for the library now, a Methodist church back then. Right, yes, the parsonage for the library, right. Um, this house right here uh, at this time was William Ford's house who ran the mill. It is now the house of Carol Jean Rotner and it was moved back from the road at some point in town. The other interesting thing about this is that Right here, this open space, that's where the Redmond's Hall would be built later. Um, well, we know it's before that time. Um, it was built around 1909 or 1910, right there. So this image was, was taken before that. And of course, you got, you know, you had, you had your wooden sidewalks all through the village, so. 
I, sometimes people don't think of Pemaquid Falls so much as a village now, but it, it certainly was a village back then. Is the one-room is, is one schoolhouse there yet? Uh, yes, it, yeah, the, it would be, well, it's the second building okay. in. I think that right there is the edge of it, yeah. but yeah. I will That's show you a picture of it. So if you turned onto Harrington Road, here is Harrington Road, and this is the McKinley Schoolhouse right here. And you can see it's a group of students probably out front. I would say that's the school teacher. And Chuck has looked at this very carefully, and he says, that's John Henry Cartland right there. Um, if you don't know John Henry Cartland, he was a big promoter of colonial Pemaquid and um, did a lot to preserve history in this area around the turn of the century. Again, the beautiful sidewalks that went all the way up. Liv Hanna taught there. Liv Hanna? Yeah, yeah. Rusty yeah. went to school there. Yeah. yeah. I think that was it. Yes, there's still people that went to school in, Pem in the one room schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. Pete Hope and Mrs. Sproul was a teacher. I can't, I can't remember her first name. Yeah. Liv Sproul? Uh, Sproul. Oh, come on. Pa Sproul's sister, I think. Mm. Oh, 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 oh. Eleanor. Ellen, yeah, Ellen, Ellen, that's right. Yes. I'm from away. <laughs> <laughs> I only know history through the history. <laughs> this is a close-up of that postcard, so you can see, you can, so when I looked at this, again, once you colorize them, they're not so sharp detail like yeah. the black and white photos. Um, but this guy, he, I don't even think they colored his face. It looks like a black and white, and you will, you'll notice certain parts of these postcards look like, oh, they decided not to put any color there. It looks like the original black and white photo. He's got a boat. It looks like yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this was on the back of this card, you know. Uh, postcards were, became very popular during this time, one, because they were new, you know, they were brand new form of communication. They were cheap and they were fast to send in the mail. This postcard sent from Bristol over to Louds Island and, it, and it's an advertisement for the drama. You and your friend had better come to the drama at the town hall, Bristol Mills, Friday evening, February 4th, 1910. How is everything at Loudville? <laughs> Is that when Osher, is that a relative? Uh, well, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I guess I had a little <laughs> help there. But. <clears throat> oh, this was on the back of that, uh, another postcard, but the same view, but a different, different writing there. And I wrote this here so it'd be easier for me to read. Um, Isn't this a pretty view of the falls? I am almost done cleaning, and we are very busy at the store. I ought to do some sewing before it gets hot. Wish I had room to write more. <laughs> that, I wanted to mention that because there was, you know, nothing is without controversy. There were those who said that postcards were ruining the art of letter writing. So. <laughs> Here we have a view behind the mill. Um, this, is, this is the Pemaquid Mill. This is the back of the mill. You can see all the lumber that has been cut and stacked up. And then this is a fishway, and um, maybe someone can explain this better. I take it this is to help the fish go down the falls and avoid the turbines, um, not to help the fish go up the river as we build the fishways now. but. Could it be for they caught the allies up higher and they were that's the way of getting them on a boat? I don't I think it's for returning allies. Oh, they're, okay, they've thinking. spawned and now they're coming back and returning to the sea at this point. And this is the fish ways allowing them to do that. Oh. Okay, is this an earlier or later postcard? <laughs> All right, you're now becoming experts because you've got the, the, it doesn't extend all the way to the end of the
postcard. Um, this is a very pretty view from Pemaquid Harbor. I wonder if, if this was from the Edgemere Hotel. There was a large hotel there. And the Edgemere is much further to the right, yes. up on the hill. OK. Side. Over on this side? Yes. Yeah. OK. I, I'm, not, I'm never quite sure exactly where that sits, but I believe there is a the what? Uh, Admiral Fitch's house. Oh, okay. Which is right up in here. Okay. So David Fitch lives there now. Okay. Um, something interesting about this postcard, you can see it's a very early postcard. I have found this same image, this same colorized image, but on one of the later cards extending over the whole, the whole card and with a divided back. And the reason I mention that is because just because we could date when it was printed does not mean that is the date the photograph was taken. So the photograph could be taken, you know, any time prior to its printing. Is so, the, is the fort in there? Can you see if the fort? Is the there? fort has not been built yet. Okay. So it's so prior it's to 1909. It was shot prior to 1909, and the divided back started in 1909. And we know this was printed before this 1909. Is our view, and there's a famous painting from. I think there's a there was a Moat Hotel right right where we're right was it standing right there now. And I mean, was it the Windermere Hotel? Hotel. <laughs> we have we have we have uh, descendants from uh, that ran the Windermere Hotel, which was also in this area. So, That's, you know, this would be where the pen cap, the Tom and uh, Nancy Ireland's house is. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, right there. Yeah. Okay. Now I've got it. This is interesting because I've never heard of the canyon in Pemaquid. And I found that some of these older cards show views of um, areas that were of interest to tourists in 1900 that I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. So the canyon, we did post it on Facebook, and we found out that it is on, on Herring, this is not the Pemaquid River, uh, it's beyond that, um, on Harrington Road and on land that is currently owned by Stuart Mahan, but there's a creek there that, that goes down, and there was apparently, or is apparently, a, a beautiful little canyon that goes up in there, and someone there shot little it. Little Falls Brook. Little Falls Brook. Okay. And, and yeah. uh, Chadwick's, it, yeah. it's, Chadwick owns one side of the, the Chadwick House. I don't know who the president of it is, but, but it, it is very steep, and, uh, uh. It's very pretty if you come to the high top. Do you see this view from the road? No. From here? No, no you, there's a bridge. The yeah. town built a bridge there recently. Yeah. Uh, it's the right estuary of the Hemingway yeah. River as it okay. makes its way up. It's like yeah. a little fjord mm -hmm. as it goes right up in there it goes, to mm -hmm. meet the fresh water of Little Falls Stream. Mm -hmm. Instead of going up to the, you know, to the mill, you go, you turn left and, well, Little Falls Brook, it goes all the way up to Biscay mm -hmm. and so it comes mm -hmm. down through it. And, and, they had to cross the, the uh, Harrington Meeting House had to be pulled across that waterway. Yeah. Where the road is. And, and there's a tradition that that's where Samoset had a summer camp, right in that area there. Oh, mm -hmm. interesting. Was, you know, yeah. I, I've heard that many times now. Well, this is the other side of the canyon. People used to come up in boats to visit or to view the canyon from the water side. This would be or, the mill pond, what we call the mill pond, I think, that's where the river upstream. meets the salt right there. That's just upstream of the present bridge. Oh, just upstream. Yeah. I oh. used to say I've seen this picture many times. Oh, so, yeah. sir. <laughs> and who, who was the guy that drew the, oh, Larry, uh, yeah, Larry, oh, I can't remember. So you're saying, are you saying this is a pond on the Pemaquid River? Or is it? The mill pond, the mill pond backed up the river under the bridge around to Carol Rotten's house. Okay, so and it's up there. And so this, this, oh. is, this is the ducky race right there. Oh. This, this is the ducky race, just upstream of the yeah, Route 13 Bridge. 
thank you for telling me. I thought this was where you came up to the canyon. <laughs> Wonderful. We're going to head down to Pemmiquid Beach now. Um, and here's a, it's not a particularly pretty postcard colorized, but you can see it's very heavy on the yellow in there and not too much variation in color, but the woody road to the beach. There's still some paths that look like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and people have always thought the beach is beautiful. Um, it, you may know Dad, that it did not look like that over there today. <laughs> no. I heard from my granddaughter that there was no place left on the beach. To I bet it was a madhouse. I bet town. it was. Tom must have made a ton of money. <laughs> well, that's interesting because I was going to mention that um, the town of Bristol did not develop the the public park at the beach until 1959. And so, um, and, and as I understand it, uh, the Pemmiquid Trail, people used to get to their cottages going across the beach. And the, the, the ice really delivery man. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. right, yes. And that the ice delivery trucks would drive across the beach to deliver ice uh, to the cottages there. I thought Fred Partridge sold that before 60, not in the 50s? It was, well, they, the it town got there. a big grant, and, but what, the town borrowed a lot of money. 50, I in, think it was sold yeah. <laughs> And so not everything's about history. That's uh, a beautiful moonlight on the beach. Then we head over to the fort, another early card, as you can see. Um, it looks like this audience probably knows a lot about the development of the uh, colonial Pemaquid already, but this is before there was a monument. You can see the rock that is inside the current tower at the, at the fort. Um, it was developed, uh, well, there was this idea that they would like to build a monument for Fort William Henry, and so it began to be uh, commercialized by John Henry Cartland to try to attract visitors, to try to raise money. The date 1607, they, they kind of wanted to say that Pemaquid was, even, uh, exactly, exactly. We're, we're the earliest of anybody. So uh, I, that's not a very good date. But, um, and you can see they built an entrance. It says the Fort Rock of Pemaquid. They charged admission to go into the fort and see the rock. And here is uh, John, John Henry Cartland himself giving a little lecture about how we were earlier than Jamestown. <laughs> and the people who paid admission got to climb on top of the rock. Um, and you can see there, there was, you can see the ruins of the old fort. As you know, the fort was torn down by the people of Bristol um, to keep it out of the hands of the British during the Revolutionary War. So, um, so there, is, there was a foundation. That's the fort, the fort house is still there. Yeah, and still there. Yeah, and the fort house is still there. And then just two more, I have two more pictures of the fort rock. It was, there were lots of postcards of the fort rock, but I just wanted to show you these two to contrast because you can see this is hardly, this, this is black and white photograph from, you know, from over there it's not even colorized. And then you've got the red roof sticking out. And then you've got a little bit of yellow on the rock. And that's about it. That's a colorized photograph. And then you've got a Hugh C. Layton photo, uh, yeah, one. Yeah. And it's, it's so pretty. They've got the, the little wildflowers in there and the variation. Is that rock ledge still there? Oh, yes. The tower is built around it. Oh, that's yes. in the same. Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. 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 Here's pulling back a little bit. You can see this is, again, before the fort. The fort was actually, uh, well, the fort was a 
contract was given to George Little in 1907. The fort was finished in 1908, and it was dedicated in 1909. And so this is prior to 1908. You can see what we just saw, the entranceway there, and the rock and the flag on top of it and some other things. They, he also discovered ancient pavings and covered them over, and you could pay admission to see the ancient pavings. Yeah? What's the land building beside the uh, fort house? Uh, it's a barn. The partridges were farmers. That, there was a big farm there in the 1800s, um, and they tore up a lot of those ancient pavings to make better fields for farming. Um, and the barn came down. I don't know when the barn came down. But. The uh huh. The if you heard Chuck, the foundation for that barn is still there. And here's a little closer up. You can see it's quite a gathering. I'm not quite sure. It's it's it could have been a photograph that was taken of um, one of the the main historical society would take expeditions down to Pemaquid for their meetings, and that's where the interest got generated by people not even from town, but people interested in colonial Pemaquid history to build a monument. Um, they were in the 1800s. Um, I've got some dates here somewhere, but, um, well, 1870, 1869, 1871, that's when the Maine Historical Society was coming down and getting interest going. In um, the Pemaquid Monument Association was formed in 1872, and it took 36 years for them to actually get the fort built. So that shows a lot of commitment. Um, to sticking, sticking with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, takes, it takes people to, to want to persevere. Uh, the next post, well, I will put it on. I love to read the best of these. Let me find. <clears throat> I, uh, I had to, I, I really um, uh, sympathized with the person that wrote this. If you know me, you know that I have run a, been in the hospitality business for a long time, renting cottages. And I just, uh, something about this message, it says, Dear Margie, I will write you soon. My boarders all went yesterday. I have had a busy summer. Hope you got your tax bill all right. <laughs> Laura sent you Mr. Hadley, oh, Laura sent you that Mr. Hadley had commenced to move. I am awfully tired. All through August, um, from 20 to 25 to cook for. I suppose that picture looks natural enough. It was the picture of the fort. And so that's interesting. Edna sends it to uh, someone over here. Oh, sends it to Miss somebody. And then, that per Miss Armstrong, it looks like. And then Miss Armstrong sends it along to, to Nellie and says, or sends it along to someone, give this card to Nellie. It was sent me by Everett's wife. I have been there, it's very pretty. I'm thinking she sends it to Nellie because Nellie collects postcards. <laughs> and here's, here's this photograph again in full. Um, it's interesting, John Henry Cartland took this photograph, and, uh, and the next one too. So the only two photos that, that I have of the, or that we have of the dedication, were photos that John Henry Cartland took. And he, he also sent postcards to Germany to be printed. Uh, these German printers would have offices in the United States, you know, and you could use the office. And, uh, yeah. I, it was actually taken by another photographer, natural photographer. Oh. Hartman, I think, hired this photographer. Oh. But I can't think of the photographer's name. Okay. I just saw that on the back it just said John Henry yeah, Cartland. He probably commissioned it, but I, I think uh, there's something up here. 
There was a well-known photographer who shot all this stuff. Ah, great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And this is also from the, the dedication, just looking the other way. And yeah, from the tower, yeah. And um, I like, I li uh, this is interesting. You can see the colorization process, like some of them still look in black and white, uh, because again, this starts as a black and white photograph with the paint layered on afterwards. And then of course, once the, who do you think printed this card? <laughs> Hugh C. Layton, is, because you can see how beautiful it is, the beautiful colors. I, when, we, when we first started collecting things uh, a few years ago, OBHS and I became involved, I was like, I don't like these old ones, you know. They're just paintings, and Chuck, Chuck, who knows all, I said, they're not paintings, they're formed from photographs. So I had to learn from the very beginning that they are photographs, they've just been colorized to look and they look like, many of them look like paintings. Uh, but you can see where the artist <laughs> must have added the flags because flags don't fly like that. <laughs> and then this is looking in the other direction from the fort uh, to the steamer dock uh, that was John Partridge's lobster dock. Um, there is a freighter uh, steamer that is in. The sign on here says, danger, no teams allowed on the wharf. So don't bring your horses and your, your horse team on the dock. Do you, do you have a date? Do you have a year associated? Um, let's see. It's postmarked 1910. But as I said before, it doesn't mean that's when it was shot. But I would think it, it would be because look at all the tourists arriving. You know, tourism really picked up after the fort was made. And the other thing I thought was odd about this, do you think there were really green, lots of green boats like that? <laughs> it's kind of an odd color. <clears throat> and then into the village of, of uh, Pemaquid Beach. This is on the Loop Road, and if you know this building, it has been called the Pemaquid Tavern. Um, prior to being the tavern, it was a general store, Charles Sproul store, and we have some older pictures that show the store. And then in, uh, what year was it? Uh, well, I don't have it, but around um, 1912 or something like that, Sproul, uh, Charles Sproul sold it to an enterprising young man, Fred Gatcom. Um, now I'm from senior moment. Fred? Fred Gatcom. Gatcom Crawford. Yeah. Fred Crawford, Crawford, Crawford Gatcom. Yes, yeah. Sometimes they call him Fred, sometimes they called him Crawford. And His he. was 102, Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and she was a, a McLean? No? I think she was a McLean. Yeah. The right. Um, and he, he maintained the store, but he also added shore dinners in the summer to accommodate all the tourists. So it was very popular for shore dinners. And then even later, he added dancing. So when I was a kid, I was like, why is that called the tavern? There's never been a tavern there, but that's kind of the history of the tavern. There was a little store next door to that <coughs> tavern, I think, because we lived next to the little house that was supposedly the store, and when they were uh, remodeling it, they found all kinds of bottles that people, I guess, were drinking tonics from. Ah, Are you, is it the little Vega cottage, or? Uh, no, uh, the one that was the store was right next to the tavern. Oh. It's a yellow house Okay. Now. Then we're next door, I think two sisters had houses, and then the Vega is in front there. So, yeah, wow. It's so interesting. I know there was another store um, out of, this side uh, going down towards uh, Little Beach. Uh, there was the 
Cabot Lyford's house and um, Claude Tookie's house, and Claude Tookie's house was a store at one time as well. So we're going to head down to Pemaquid Point now. Um, and uh, so postcards and tourism go together. <laughs> and the Pemaquid Hotel, um, well, tourism really began to speed up here in the late 1800s. The Hotel Pemaquid uh, was built, uh, it opened July, 4th of July, 1888. And I wanted to read something from the Pemaquid Messenger. I have a little couple of things here. The Pemaquid Messenger, November 16th, 1887. So right before the winter starts. And just a little, just a little note. With one or two hotels and from 15 to 20 cottages to be built, the season of 88 ought to be a lively one for Bristol carpenters. <laughs> and so they were building the Hotel Pemaquid. The other hotel they were building was the Ocean View House. The Ocean View House is on New Harbor Hill, directly across from Riley's store, where Dewey Chase Rentals is. There had been a building there that had burned, and Than Hanna decided, rebuilt. It was his house, house and store. He decided to rebuild, and what better to build than a hotel for all those new tourists? <laughs> Oh, the other, I, I have to read this too, because um, this, is, this is something. This is the Pemaquid Messenger in 1891. This is also about tourism. August 20th, 1891. And in the 1800s, if you, you know about Bristol Industries, the rise and fall of this and that, and, and Bristol was trying to find a new industry uh, t for the people. So late 1800s, we settled on the development of tourism. Not without controversy, however. <laughs> uh, so Pemaquid Messenger. There are families living in Bar Harbor, it is said, who spend $15,000 in a season. This is the sort of item that makes an average main man smile from ear to ear. <laughs> and, and proves how false is the argument made by many that the summer visitors are of no benefit, that they leave no money in a place, uh, in a place during their stay. Bristol hasn't been fortunate enough to secure any of those $15,000 ones, but she has, the, she has the attractions that will bring them here in time. <laughs> so. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything on the surf casino? Not, uh, we, we do in our collection. We do in our collection. Uh, Yes. Yes, yes. Sorry, they're not in the talk tonight, but. <laughs> I'm, and it's, you know, and I know it's, it's already past eight, and uh, I always go over. So if, if you do need to leave, need to leave, please feel free, because I talk a lot. Um, this is just from the steps of the Pem Hotel Pemaquid. A nice, um, a nice scene to send home and say where you're relaxing. Down toward the, the loop road. The loop, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. This is one of my favorite postcards. It's, it's, it's not a, a Hugh C. Layton card, but I just love, it, it looks like a painting to me. It's hard to think of this as a photograph, but it was at one point. And then, of course, the surf is always an attraction for people. Um, but, you know, not everybody who travels likes to travel. <laughs> um, so I had to read this one, too. Dear Cog, letter received. I was afraid something dreadful had happened. Surely, uh, sorry you feel so poorly. We are now moved. I feel like a lost chicken and would like to go home. Love to all. <laughs> no. 
And this is a Hugh C. Layton postcard. Very pretty. Let's see, why do I have another one here? Oh, um, I'm just gonna, uh, the next postcard shows the back, but I'm just gonna read it so you can look at the postcard while I read this. Um, it, it's just very lovely little postcard home. And here I am, Nancy, off on a little vacation trip with Miss Bosley. We came down to Pemaquid Point the last day of June for three weeks. After that, I shall go home to Beverly. This is a beautiful place. We haven't had any storm yet, but we've had fine surf for two days, and we go in bathing every day in pools down near the water's edge. Then, then we, then we, <laughs> Then we play in the breakers. <laughs> I hope you have a happy summer and come back to us in September. <laughs> and that, of course, is her, is her writing there. I picked out this one. It's not a particularly well-colored postcard, but um, it goes back to the uh, tourist attractions that I never knew about growing up. <laughs> Uh, the Old Man of the Sea, and I've seen several things showing rock formations that were named down at Pemaquid Point. And you can see, I, I assume, there's the man, the Old Man of the Sea. And I was really interested to see this because I have a photograph of my father when he was a boy. It's probably taken 1928. And I know, he's standing right there. <laughs> so he knew about the old man of the sea, but I never knew about it. And here's another lovely, oh, this is not Hugh it's Metropolitan News Company. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost, I'm, this is, I'm almost surprised we don't have the reflection of the, <laughs> of the lighthouse in there. <laughs> I was kind of waiting to see that. We got some pools, but yeah. the quintessential shot. Yeah, that, that uh, ridge of rock is much long, uh, longer in that picture than it is now. Oh. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the white the waves and the fresh water uh, has uh, downed much of that end of that rock. Mm. Okay. <laughs> And this one is so sparse. Yeah. It looks so, so pretty. Yeah. Nice. And then we go over to New Harbor here. Um, my dad always talked about the field being bare, you know, it's, it, of course, this is New Harbor Hill looking down. Um, all these old, all these old uh, postcards. Never get my parent, my grandfather's house. <laughs> it's right here. <laughs> and looking from the south side over. I thought this was interesting. I was noticing how far down the tide went uh, before. It was dredged, you know, it was, I don't know when it was first dredged. I know it was dredged in the 60s. I don't know if it was dredged earlier than that. I also, I, I don't know this. I was just looking, every single one has that. I'm wondering, is that the outhouse on the back of the barn? Yeah. And what was the other thing I was thinking of? What year do you think that is? Um, it's postmarked September 11th, 1909. It's a divided back, um, well, it was printed between 1907 and 1909. Yeah. Again, the image might have been earlier, but it was printed 1907 to 1909. Here's another view of the harbor. I, uh, the backs are almost as interesting as the front sometimes. Uh, just little little snippets, but this one just said, uh, thanks for the card, was very glad to hear from you. Those buildings on this card look like fishermen shacks. <laughs> uh, 
that's that's all it says. <laughs> Fred Brackett would be insulted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, this, this was a brand new building when this was taken. Um, uh, it's actually postmarked August 27, 1912. It burned and was rebuilt within a very, the people of town rebuilt it so quickly. And, um, and then a postcard was created, I'm sure, as in celebration and to show off their beautiful new church. And here's a view from the south side, down through the trees. This is the Gosnold Arms, right there. The, where the Gosnold Arms is now, it was uh, the Danforth. And this, I'm, I, I believe the steamer wharf, well. When was that, the 20s or? Um, Again, it was printed between 1907 and 1909. Because the steamers used to come in. Yes, yeah. yes. I was thinking this is the steamer wharf down in front, but maybe not. Um, it's kind of hard to see through the trees. That's pretty. And then, of course, lots and lots of postcards of Bat Cove, yeah. just like there are now. Mm -hmm. So pretty. And as you were saying, there's the steamer going into New Harbor. Do I have a date? Um, let's see. This one uh, in 19, why, the reason why we can date some of these is because Hugh C. Layton uh, merged with Valentine, the Valentine Printing Company. And so after 1909, it's Layton and Valentine. So, um, we know that this was printed after 1909. The steamer often, when you went into New Harbor, didn't go into Round Pond. It went to Louds Island. Mm. There were three big wharves there, and it was easier for the Round Pond people to get all their shopping over on Louds Island rather than go to Damascot. Wow. Stop there. And here's another one. I just love this one. Yeah. Uh, again, it looks like a painting, not like a poke. So what is he doing? Probably uh, stirring the pot. <laughs> <laughs> oil. Bait barrel. Oh, oil, bait, yeah. <laughs> Miss ah, okay. Pretty. And here's another one through the trees. I mean, you can understand why people wanted to collect these cards. They're, they're beautiful. And there's the, the footbridge in Bat Cove. Yeah. So interestingly enough, I, I don't know if there were not many colorized postcards done of Long Cove. We only have two in our collection, and this is one. Um, of the cottages that were that were being developed. This is postmarked 1909. Um, that's Chamberlain. Chamber, Chamberlain, I'm sorry, I, I said the wrong thing, yeah. <laughs> the, um, just out of curiosity, uh, the Long Cove Point Association was established in 1908. Um, and, that's but Long the Cove Point, Long Cove Point, yes, this is Long Cove Point. So the cottages yeah. were already being built, and then as people um, populated these cottages, they formed the Long Cove Point Association. Yeah. And there's a wonderful book by Jim Lyon um, that just came out this last winter um, that. Um, talks about the history of Long Cove, and it's it was originally very, written by John Neff, Reverend John Neff, and then Jim added a new addition to it all. Mm. It's very well done. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it can be ordered on Amazon. We also have a copy in our collection. 
And this was the only other postcard that I had of, of Long Cove. So then we move over to Round Pond. We have some more movie magic. <laughs> so keep your eye on the photo. Yeah, yeah, for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, as you go down Route 32, there used to be a bandstand right in the, in the middle at that intersection. Is that a utility pole? Do you think it has electricity? I didn't get electricity around until Yeah. No, I don't see any other poles. Is all over the car. Where the lady is standing. Uh, right the there. Car. Front of the grid and all. Yeah. We took pictures in the middle of the telegraph wire going by. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have electricity, I thought. Until yeah. the 20s. Yeah. Until World War II. Right. Yeah. That's correct. After World War II, it came in. Grandpa, was it? Electrified in the early 30s. Yeah. 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 And then we have a picture of the Morton House. It, you probably recognize this house as you go down into Round Pond. It still looks the same, has the same shape, and it, it was one of our early boarding houses in the 1800s. And they served meals there, too. And then across the street, uh, what some of us know is, is uh, Foster's, yeah, yeah, used to be the Harborview Hotel. It's postmarked 1913. And here's one I really love. Um, you don't usually see pictures of this, but um, as you go past the Granite Hall store on the left, like you're going up to North Shore Road, you may or may not realize you're crossing a stone bridge and the little house, the little house yeah. still looks the same. Neon Monroe house. Yeah. Monroe house. Very pretty. Maybe granite remnants from the... the Probably from shore. the actual quarry there, yeah. So at some point, the steamer did come into Round Pond. <laughs> later, yeah. later on, um, this is postmarked 1913. Yeah, it's a big, doesn't that look so big, the, the steamer, compared to the town? And then here's the. Yeah. And here, here's another view I never really thought of. It's going out of Round Pond towards Bremen. But they, you know, we have several postcards of the willows um, in Round Pond. So there were these lovely trees. I don't think they're still there today, but uh, they caught people's attention enough to take several photographs. It would have been hard to go down that road during bud season. <laughs> yes, look at that. <laughs> but you could walk down that road on the nice sidewalks. Board sidewalks that they put in so people could walk up and down. Lovely. Okay, so we are coming to the end here. So, um, the end of the postcard craze, collecting. As I said, postcards were brand new. It was exciting to collect them. Beautiful cards uh, uh, printed in Europe and in Germany. In 1909, this is before the end, but in 1909, you know, tariffs, you know, there's always tariffs that we're talking about. They decided that the postcard craze was so big that maybe we could help out American printers of postcards by imposing a tariff on all those foreign postcards. And so in 1909, it became more expensive for, um, for these companies to import their cards from, from Europe. So it made them more expensive. It did boost American production, uh, printing of cards, but they did not have the artistry 
of Europe, and the cards began to not be as nice. And there's a card there as an example. You can see that it's just not as beautiful. Um, and then the real end came with World War I because postcards from Germany stopped completely. Uh, the other publishers in Europe, it, that was also disrupted. So that ended the artistic postcard era. And, um, and then you know what? They weren't so new anymore. <laughs> and telephones started coming into um, use. There was also the influenza, you know, the pandemics and stuff. And so Americans lost interest in collecting postcards, at least for the time, the time being. So they were in common use in the 50s. And so that's right. Uh, um, I, mean, I used to get my grades from college on the postcard. They weren't kind of, we, yep. we wouldn't buy colored ones. They were too expensive. We just buy them. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, and then, you know, and you still have the Eastern illustrating um, uh, photo cards. They're produced in Belfast. And so they were very popular during those years. Um, and then eventually you get color photography. Um, a lot in the 60s, it seems there's a million color, uh, colored photo cards. But I do want to leave you with a beautiful QC Layton postcard um, from Round Pond, and that is King Row, King Row Manor and King Row Market and the White Church. Nice. That's all I've got for you this <laughs> evening. <laughs> In two weeks' time, down at Pemmiquid Point, um, the little learning center there, uh, Jim, uh, Jim, Pe what is it? Uh, Jim Carpentier will be giving a lecture on Maysburg Ship, the Virginia. Mm -hmm. So the building of it, launching of it, and everything. So why it was built in 1607. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>